I'm Melina Tapos, and this is In Depth Conversations. For this episode of In Depth Conversations, I'm really happy and pleased to have our guest, Professor Guy Madison. You are a professor at Umeås University at the Department of Psychology. Uh, you do research in behavioral genetics as well as evolutionary psychology. And you've published many, many articles, uh, approximately 150, I think, uh, who are all peer-reviewed peer articles and a number of books cha book chapters. Uh, you've also been referenced as a statistical genius. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, you have. <laughs> uh, so I'm very, very excited to be able to have this conversation with you today. So welcome to In-Depth Conversations. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I, um, I was thinking um, to, to start off with uh, talking about uh, the r most recent papers you've, you've uh, published. Um, that have been about sex differences and psychological traits and differences between the sexes and a few questions around that. And I was wondering what really got you interested uh, in the first place in this kind of research. Yes, it's not really um, my own choice, you might say. Mm. Uh, I came into academia uh, from my interest in music, really. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, been what, what I uh, spent most of my academic work on. Uh, rhythm and timing and uh, experiences of music and things like that. But a few years ago, uh, we were informed from the uh, vice chancellor th that uh, we were supposed to do something that was called, you might call it gender integration in English, genus integrering, mm -hmm. which meant uh, that uh, we had to, as university teachers, we were required to uh, apply a gender perspective on uh, everything we do, as mm -hmm. I understood it. So uh, our teaching, our research, our uh, preparation of courses, everything should have uh, a gender perspective. And many of us at the department were very confused about this. What does it really mean in reality to have a gender perspective? Does it, for example, mean, as some people thought, that we needed to have equal numbers of male and female teachers, perhaps? Perhaps uh, uh, problematizing the fact that there are more females among the students? Or what could it be? So, so uh, because of this confusion, we had um, <clears throat> one of our colleagues offered to prepare a course for the teachers at the department, how to, to do this. And she uh, is herself experienced in the gender studies uh, field. So I took this course together with my colleagues and uh, we, well, we were told a lot of things, many of which were surprising to me. For example, that there are no uh, differences between men, men and women at all that could possibly lead to any differences in outcomes. Uh, we were also introduced to very cryptic uh, concepts like um, intersectionality, which when I looked it up uh, in the Swedish encyclopedia, had a very long and involved, uh, I shouldn't say definition, but description. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this got me on the track that there is, there are a number of things that are poorly understood in this field. So that that simply um, raised my curiosity, mm. and that's the simple reason why I have been studying uh, sex at all in any. Uh, in any of those ways that I have. Yeah, I'm really fascinated by that story because um, it feels like it's a genuine curiosity to find out more about this uh, mm -hmm. because you had an intuition that, or m perhaps, I don't know if it's fair to say, but um, that you didn't walk away from that course understanding fully what you, you did, nothing became much more clear for you. No, so, yeah. it didn't. Uh, yeah. In some senses, it made us all very, very much more confused. More confused, yes. yeah. Um, and I feel like there's a lot of, uh, and me amongst them, with a lot of people today when we have this discussion about what it really means with having this gender perspective and in academia for research and so on. Um, so then, then what did you do? Do you want to um, 
so you, what was the first uh, sort of spark or, or question that you raised? Uh, do you remember? <coughs> I think, well, uh, judging from the first papers that we published, mm -hmm. uh, it was a curiosity about the field of gender studies. Mm -hmm. Because, as I mentioned, my colleague uh, work, works in, in gender studies, uh, uh, although she's a psychologist by training, uh, and, uh, but she applies the gender perspective in her research. And uh, there were a lot of things taken as axioms. Mm -hmm. Uh, I understood from uh, in this perspective. Uh, for example, that um, uh, th this idea of relativism, uh, that uh, or which is vaguely associated, as, as I assume, with postmodernism, that there is the, the, there doesn't exist any objective truth. That's one of the axioms that seem to be in vogue here, uh, and also that. Uh, most of the things that come out of academia um, depend on power structures rather than facts and knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, I, I got the impression that the knowledge itself and which knowledge that is focused upon is a function of power structures in society. That's what the intersectionalists say, right? No, or, no. I don't think so. Uh, uh -huh. Barring that I'm not sure uh, still what inter intersectionality stands for, but that's not... Oh, the gender studies would yes, say. Yes, okay, the gender sorry. studies yes. perspective okay. would, yes. would claim, would claim these, this. thi okay. these yes. things. Yeah. And uh, so the consequences of this for um, the research or academic work is that it seems that Gender studies as an academic field is not very interested in, in empirical data, uh, and uh, in particularly not in quantitative data. But uh, on the other hand, it's, you, it's fair to say that it's strongly politicized or at least ideologically charged. And so I became curio curious as to how large an impact the field as such has. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the first things we did was to conduct a few bibliometrical studies mm -hmm. uh, comparing gender studies uh, articles specifically mm -hmm. with other comparable articles that do not apply a gender perspective. Yeah. So, and according to the evaluation that we were presented with, that this new and better form of science, of doing science, uh, should be more successful and more interesting, mm -hmm. you would expect that uh, gender studies perspective articles would have uh, more citations. Uh, but it turned out to be the opposite. Mm -hmm. So what we did was simply to um, uh, collect a database of articles uh, using the keywords sex uh, or, and gender, or gender, I mean, whatever. Mm -hmm. And of course, when you do that, you find a lot of articles from medicine and biology. Mm -hmm. uh, but we restricted our study sample to the social sciences. And then we could also uh, separate the social sciences studies uh, by whether they applied this gender perspective or not. Okay. And uh, so those are the populations that we compared. Mm. And is there, uh, is, what is really the difference between saying sex or gender in this, just so we're clear on how you, how you did this uh, search? Or is there Well, uh, the search, well, the thing is that sex is fairly, it's, it's fairly uncontroversial what it means. It's uh, the biological makeup of an individual that is determined by the chromosomes. Mm -hmm. uh, but gender, on the other hand, uh, is, well, often re referred to as social sex for short. But what really complicates this issue is that uh, since the 1980s or so, many research articles have begun to use gender in replacement of sex. So what, what they actually ask people about, or th they simply judge from their uh, uh, 
the personal security numbers or from how they look. Yeah. They just determine that this is a woman or this is a man, mm -hmm. but they call this gender. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, so the situation becomes very confused. And that's why we use both keywords in our search. Ah, uh -huh, okay. All right. Um, okay, interesting. Good. Because, yeah, there is, I mean, there's speculations of having a third gender, legal gender in Sweden now, mm -hmm. which obviously can't be uh, determined by sex, I guess. In in the w uh, yeah in the way that we're defining sex here, but okay. So you did this uh, this search, and then um, if we uh, fast forward to today, mm -hmm. uh, I think last year you had a, a, uh, an article published that the title is "Sex Differences in the Number of Scientific Publications and Citations When Attending the Rank of Professor in Sweden." It's a long title, but <laughs> mm. um, an interesting article, nevertheless. Um, mm. I liked. Uh, because I liked it very much because it, it um, applies a, something specific to that we could control for or do empirical research on on what's ap actually happening in academia because we have these discussions right on uh, why men and women perform differently and a lot of it is anecdotal mm. but you actually did this work here mm. and do you want to tell us just a bit um, what your research showed in this study? Well one of the most startling uh, differences uh, between men and women in academe is that the, uh, there are so few women on the highest level mm. uh, in Sweden. Uh, it's called professors. Uh, internationally, we would refer to it as a tenured professor. That is when you have a, a permanent position, a uh, permanent research position. Mm. And it's, it's really startling that at this time, a few years back, uh, there, there were uh, you know, three men uh, for every one woman. Mm. Twenty-five percent are, of professors are female, yeah. uh, and that is, of course, I mean, it's it's mind-boggling. How is it possible mm. when, in fact, uh, a majority of first-year students are female? But how long has that been the case? Do you know? Uh, it has been increasing steadily uh, yeah. for a long time. I'm not sure when they became a majority. Mm. But they, uh, they, are certainly, uh, they are certainly almost as large, have been for decades. Mm, for a long time. Uh, yes. And uh, why, so you th you're saying that uh, the, th the mind-boggling thing here is mm. that why are they not continuing yes. on to higher levels? Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and that's, uh, th that's a great source uh, of uh, discontent mm. Uh, mm. for people who strive for sex equality. Mm. of course. Mm. And uh, the, the theme or the main theory that we were uh, presented with at th this course is simply that there is uh, discrimination against women. Mm. Uh, so that men are favored yeah. when uh, they s apply for positions, yes. even though they have lower, may have lower merits than the women, mm. they will still be hired. And if that were the case, it would be horrible mm. because we are supposed to be uh, a well-functioning meritocracy. Yes. Yeah, that's how it ties in. Exactly. Mm. So with that premise, your study showed something different, right? That it's, um, yes. So, so we theorized that if this kind of discrimination is going on mm. at the hiring uh, mm. or evaluation of applicants for professorships, yeah. Then, of course, the women that uh, are reluctantly uh, accepted mm. will have much higher merits, of course. Mm. Mm. That makes sense. Yes. yes. Uh, so, so we simply wanted to confirm this fact, uh, or this, I mean, this assumption. very natural mm -hmm. assumption. assumption yeah. And we were quite surprised when we found that it, it was the opposite. Mm. Uh, in fact, there was a uh, you know, pretty significant difference in, in the sense that the, the women that had been accepted for professorships had fewer publications and fewer citations on each of those publications as well. Yeah. And now, of course, I think that's an interesting result because I think it says uh, something significantly about how academia is. So you've, in a sense, debunked uh, the idea that academia as an institution or organization, how it's organized is somehow biased. But what do you think about uh, uh, if the differences start earlier than that? I mean, the discrimination starts earlier than that. So maybe these things happen already in society, on a societal level. 
Mm. So even if academia is not biased, do, could we have this in other places, in other uh, institutions, or stru structurally in our culture in a way that makes women fall off here or not being able to publish once they're on those levels? Do you, I mean, do you see other fa factors playing a part? Uh, That's, uh, of course, possible. Mm. And that is uh, also part of this general narrative that uh, from, from the cradle, Men, uh, boys and girls are treated differently in such a way that they are uh, assigned uh, different roles and then they comply with these expectations. And uh, if that is the case, it is, you know, virtually impossible to disentangle those effects mm -hmm. from other possible effects like biological or hormonal effects mm -hmm. simply because they co-vary and they cannot be separated because we cannot perform, we cannot control the um, uh, one or the other type mm -hmm. of uh, variable that affects people but they are uh, inherently confounded as we say. Yeah. And in, in that scenario uh, it's very, very difficult at least to decide or to uh, assess how large these effects are respectively. Mm. But that hasn't been on the table at all. Mm. Uh, the uh, hormonal or biological effects that I mentioned mm. haven't been even considered mm. in, the, uh, in the equality work that, that ha has been applied. Mm. Um, so your question was. So no, it leads me to my next question. So, uh, no, so I want, I'm, oh, I'm sure I haven't answered the first question properly. Uh, <laughs> is it is it possible? It is possible uh, well, that. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so I think the important question here was these environmental influences. Yeah. Might they lead to women not um, choosing uh, a career in academia? Mm. Uh, for sure. That's that's or, quite possible. Or once they have uh, mm -hmm. chosen the the because that was your study, right? It was mm -hmm. already women who are able to publish but are not publishing, right? Mm -hmm. um, so once they're there, maybe they have other societal uh, reasons. <laughs> I don't know for yes. for not you know doing mm -hmm. uh, or producing as much as men in similar positions. Yes, yes, sure. So that's uh, and it has been uh, noted, for example, that. Uh, women in, uh, in higher academic positions teach more than men do. Mm -hmm. uh, so that could be a, a time thief mm. that takes uh, resources from publishing, yeah. of course. But the, and and we, uh, we can get to this only um, in an indirect sense. Mm -hmm. uh, so we looked at some studies uh, actually comparing the workload or the teaching load and found that there were actually no, no significant differences at this level of uh, academics who are uh, eligible for a professorship. Mm -hmm. But that's not proof that nothing is going on, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. And it's also a matter of time allocation. Mm. How, ma how much time do people choose to allocate to work? I mean, there are academics who have 80 hour work weeks. Mm. Um, there are people who prioritize uh, family life yes. and uh, hanging out with friends yes. and uh, yes. it, it's, a, it's a personal choice and uh, mm. in evaluating this um, um, productivity we should also take uh, the input into consideration. What do you mean by input? Well the input in, in, in um, work hours, for example, okay, yes, the it, it stands of, uh, to reason that if a person u uses more yeah. of their lifetime yes, to yeah. producing research, it should reasonably lead to to more products. Yeah, yeah, that would be interesting. You didn't mm. do no, that in we the study, right? No but that would be actually that. interesting to. There, compare. there are some studies that mm. uh, have asked people how much time they use, but mm. 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 okay, but. Um, so if we but if we look at societal level so we we know that um, like you said this equality is starting to mean that um, perhaps we shouldn't mention any differences between us <laughs> uh, personality wise between the, the sexes um, and that has spilled over to this whole science that we have now called uh, gender studies uh, that's their perspective as i understand mm. it uh, so what would be another 
explanation for this phenomena. Uh, I mean, you've we've had another f psychologist on the on the in depth conversations who was talking about um, this personality differences uh, or sex differences having an effect on personality traits, mm. for example. Mm -hmm. So I know you've done some research on this as well. Mm. Um, do you do you th what what do you see is the the differences that we could uh, boil it down to perhaps between the sexes? So, on the one hand, we have these the, this whole plethora of possible environmental effects, yes. uh, but we don't really know if they do exert an effect. It seems plausible mm. uh, and definitely possible, but we cannot follow that up in any quantitative way, way um, for the because we cannot separate uh, cause and effect, of course. Yes. Yeah. So what we could do instead one leg that we can apply is to look at, well, uh, some important uh, psychological trait differences that reasonably, or that we actually know, have consequences for mm. occupational and educational outcomes. Uh, so, what, uh, and uh, some central such traits are, of course, personality traits, mm -hmm. like the big five. Mm. Uh, so why are they more interesting or useful for us? Well, that is because we can actually say a bit more about where they come from, the cause of these uh, uh, personality differences. Mm -hmm. So it turns out in behavioral genetic studies that, that the personality traits are, are heritable to a, a large extent, at least uh, on average about 40% heritable, which speaks, uh, which uh, means that about 60% um, is the maximum that they can be influenced by mm. environmental uh, yes. causes. Yes. Well, in practice, th it is very much less because the shared environment factor, uh, that as deducted from yes. twin studies, uh, is much less than that. For some personality traits, it may be uh, somewhere between 10 and 20 percent that is influenced by the shared environment that you have in your family mm -hmm. and for other personality traits there is zero percent mm -hmm. so apparently there are other causes in play mm. now with regards to sex differences we can go a few steps longer by looking actually at the um, characteristic hormone levels of individuals mm -hmm. And such studies have been conduct conducted showing that there is, in fact, uh, a correlation mm. so uh, uh, between, between hormone levels and uh, the uh, state, uh, um, state personality traits. Okay, and then um, could you help us with like, understanding how that so you said in somehow we can generalize to sometimes because the, there's still individual differences in personality mm -hmm. of course mm -hmm. um even if you're uh, even if it's inherited it's still individual right but how how can we what is what kind of things make it masculine or feminine or male and female what kind of well i'm just simply referring to the statistical group level differences yeah, okay, so it's so, the group level. That's yeah, so the key neuroticism here. Yeah. is, mm. for example, very much higher mm. in, in women. That mm. is a tendency to, to worry and to mm. uh, assess risks higher. Yes. Mm. Uh, agreeableness is uh, also higher in females. Mm. And uh, so we have to connect uh, several lines of evidence. So on the one hand, we can connect the individual variation in personality traits with individual differences in outcomes. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so there are certain uh, systematic effects or um, associations between them. Mm -hmm. So you will, in some occupations, you will find th that uh, some personality traits are substantially lower or, or higher, or what the case might be. So that's, that's one line of reasoning. Mm. Then the next line is that we also observe mean differences, mean group differences between men and women in the same personality traits. And therefore, it m makes it likely that these differences also affect the outcome on the group level. Mm -hmm. And then going to the next step, we can find out that if we uh, are able to actually manipulate somehow the hormone levels, which are probably one, one of the most important factors 
behind the group level sex differences in personality, then if we then can show, which we can, that they have a substantial uh, effect on personality traits, then we have a whole chain of um, effects mm -hmm. on, uh, so on the tail of each other, making it at least likely that at least some of the variation in outcomes between the sexes are due to uh, actually biological uh, ultimately biological causes. causes. Okay, that's interesting. And then of course we know that's important in medicine research for example mm -hmm. to to know these differences, right? It's important to keep track of it. Um, but why do you think uh, this this has had such a great um, influence in Sweden in particular all over the world but uh, and especially in academia? Why has this, um, as you called it, perhaps uh, the ideology of this uh, mm. way of thinking of how science should be uh, instead of how it is, for example, or, or actually how they see science to be, right? They see it to be um, politically influenced, so therefore they want to shift in this political influence towards benefiting uh, gender perspective. Mm. Um, and one is not... Uh, one is not more objective than the other. Both of both of them are ideological. Why do you think this shift has happened? Because we haven't seen science to be like that before. Science has always been striving to be objective, right? That's always been the idea of what science is about. Mm. What's happened, do you think? Well, it's of course very hard to tell mm. because again, all thing, uh, very many different things change uh, simultaneously. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to disentangle causes and effects, but. One, one of my favorite candidates is actually uh, the, uh, the standard of living. Mm -hmm. uh, w with Sweden being one of the richest countries in the world, mm -hmm. per capita, mm -hmm. um, and um, in terms of, the, of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it, it seems reasonable that when all of our material needs are taken care of without really uh, we have to do anything in particular uh, mm -hmm. other than the least that is required of us to, um, to be citizens. Then we have uh, a lot of time and energy to worry about other things that might be uh, uh, not ideal. And uh, we have also uh, an evolutionary influence tendency for uh, desiring equality. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's a characteristic of, of the human condition. Yeah. Uh, and so if we notice that there are large sex differences in some areas, uh, it seems quite natural that we uh, want to fight that. Mm. And, and, they, and then comes uh, um, the, the facts of the matter into play. And as we know not sufficiently enough about the causes, uh, we are probably more prone to jump to the conclusion that the main reason for this is unfairness in, in the treatment of people. That is discrimination of various kinds or simply, uh, simply norms that uh, keep women down, for example. Mm. But when you look closer at these matters, uh, many of these claims, they actually um, they don't, don't stand up to scrutiny, really. Mm -hmm. Because it turns out that many of the choices that men and women do are very well informed in relation to their psychological makeup. So, in fact, people are working to maximize their well-being. Uh, and that, in fact, leads to different choices and different outcomes. Mm -hmm. You see this in the massive overrepresentation of women in the caring sector, mm -hmm. for example. You don't see very many women in the auto shop uh, working with your car yeah, that's right. or um, uh, draining the sewers mm. and things like that. Yeah. There's actually an interesting example too in the, in the uh, construction sector. Mm -hmm. So uh, the actual uh, 
uh, construction that that it, uh, takes place digitally mm. is mostly female mm -hmm. uh, administration and stuff like that is mostly female so when when they say that it's mostly male dominated in the ma in the mm. construction sector it's actually not true it's just that it's mostly the uh, male dominant uh, on the actual hard labor stuff <laughs> where yes. they actually have to lay the tiles for example exactly the guys with the hammers and the saws exactly in those the, are in the building yeah. sites yes and and then comes the manager uh, mm. telling them what to do yeah who is usually a woman can be female yes mm. and uh, architects and so on yes um so that's yeah so it's actually um interesting there to, to say that we try to op optimize for ourselves mm. and, and you're saying that's why we're getting these results but another thing is for example female doctors are more or female at least the uh, students uh, mm. uh, who become uh, doctors have also increased right it's a uh, yes um, but it hasn't always been that. Does the profession, do you think, change um, when it becomes more female as compared to how... Yes. Psychology, your own mm. field, isn't that also true in yeah, psychology? Yeah. We have definitely more female students than male students. Mm. I, I know that uh, newly graduated physicians are mm. about 70% female, female. In, mm. in Sweden. Not to speak of veterinarians, yes. who are 93%, I think. Oh, 93 yeah. I have never personally met a male veterinarian, okay. although I have many cats. All right. Uh, <laughs> I have met one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mm -hmm. see your point. Yeah. 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 So the segregation is huge in some areas. And, and in some areas, it, it's uh, none at all. It's mm -hmm. almost 50%. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the uh, statistics, Sweden uh, stats over sex differences in, uh, in the occupational fields, uh, I did this the other day, mm. you see something quite interesting. And that is, you, you would ex expect many fields to be more or less in the middle, but there are actually none. None. N of uh, the big fields, like yes. there are uh, approximately uh, two dozen of uh, broad occupational fields. Yeah. In the whole workforce, I oh, mean, none of them are fifty percent. None of them are fifty percent. The one oh. that comes closest is fifty-four percent. I okay. think. Which one is that? Do you remember? I don't remember. Okay. But it's yeah. something. I think it's uh, it's uh, uh, secondary school teachers, mm. or perhaps project leaders, something like that. Okay. Administrators. Mm. But you were talking about that we have this desire still that we should mm. have it equal. Yes. But. Is the desire, is the, are you talking about the biological desire or is that, do you mean the political uh, aspect of it has this, the politics somehow has this desire? Which is it? Because I think it's... Well, I think the politics is simply an expression of individuals' uh, sentiments and okay. desires, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. But so then, what is, what does it really mean to be equal? Does it mean to be 50-50, this biological desire, whatever it is? Because I have that too, of course I want equality. Mm. Yes. <laughs> um, so on the, well, on the bare surface level, of, of course, 50% uh, would be uh, re equal. Uh, if it's not 50%, if it's substantially uh, different from 50%, it, uh, it raises a lot of questions, mm. right? It's annoying, first. Uh, and then when you, uh, you have to come up with some kind of explanation for mm. it in order to accept this fact. Mm. Uh, in order to accept equality, I suppose that we need to feel that there, uh, that is, is really uh, accounted for some valid reason mm -hmm. why this is. Mm. And if we could say that this is because people truly de desire to, to work with different things, that would probably be acceptable. But we haven't come to, to that understanding yet. Yeah. This is a controversial view today. Mm -hmm. I, I, yeah, that's right, it is, mm -hmm. which is really uh, puzzling because I guess what I mean when I'm saying equality is, of course, I want equal opportunity, mm -hmm. which doesn't yes. have to mean equal um, mm -hmm. outcome. Yes. Right, it's, I so don't see in, why those two are the same. Yeah, and in a world where you compare two groups, who have, or at least you assume, they have exactly the same psychological traits. Yes. That would be the reasonable explanation, that uh, equal opportunity would also be reflected in equal outcomes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But as soon as we accept that th there is some kind of psychological difference, however small, we, we cannot make that assumption anymore. Mm. But uh, we should instead accept that there are differences in outcomes. Mm. And in fact, these, um, and 
these outcome differences can be very large because one must realize that what puts people in a occupation after say 30 years uh, of, of work mm -hmm. is a long series of choices it's not just one choice right mm -hmm. you make <clears throat> many many choices from uh, secondary school and up you try different jobs you find that you don't like it as, as much as you thought you would mm -hmm. uh, and so you switch to another job and eventually you end up uh, hopefully at an occupation that you like or at least like uh, enough uh, for uh, for it to be bearable to work there uh, to make your living mm. and considering this long long chain of decisions and and feelings and assessments of um, you you must actually um, accept the fact that these people are very well informed about themselves mm -hmm. at this point uh, after having lived for decades mm. and so it's not something arbitrary or mm. uh, surface like yeah but this is assuming a very privileged society right it, this... it's assuming equal opportunities simply that people can are able to change professions and and make their living situations yes. better at, at least as uh -huh. as a, as far as sex differences go, okay. you would uh, expect that uh, to be the result of equal opportunities. Uh, yeah. Of course, yes. if you uh, say that everyone cannot be a CEO of a big company, mm. and that is of course related to uh, to the wealth of the society or, or whatever. Mm. But that applies equally to men and women, doesn't it? In, in principle. Uh, in principle, yes. Hmm? Yeah, okay, in principle. <laughs> Given equal yes. opportunities, yes. it does. Yeah, if society um, is fortunate enough to be able to have this... Uh, because, I mean, if you're born into a farming family, for example, mm -hmm. you stay there your whole life, mm -hmm. no matter your sex, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Or, uh, well, not, not any, in, let's say, in a poor village in India, let me be specific, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? I think it's in a society like Sweden, where we have the opportunity to better ourselves and we have the opportunity to maybe change cities and move around and and yes we certainly right. have much better opportunities to do that yeah. than in many other countries yeah. for sure yeah but yeah so given uh, given our society this mm. would be the case in equal opportunity mm. yeah yeah, I agree with that. Uh, yeah and so there's a whole range of observations that we can make that all seem to reflect the, uh, a similar pattern and that is uh, a, a quite s specific uh, s set of different preferences between the sexes. Mm -hmm. So, for example, what we talked about just now, that women dominate in the caring sector, even at high-status, well-paid mm -hmm. jobs like uh, physicians, uh, veterinarians, mm -hmm. uh, and so on. And uh, also in the, in the tech sector, uh, where you mentioned the example of the construction sec sector, but it's the same segregation that incur occurs uh, amongst uh, engineers and uh, computer scientists, for example, where uh, women tend to gravitate towards uh, human relations, project mm -hmm. leading, towards ergonomics, mm -hmm. and men tend to gravitate uh, to um, hardcore programming instead, mm -hmm. uh, algorithms, things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so it would be very strange to ignore these uh, very typical patterns. They must mm -hmm. mean something. And the structure of this pattern is not at all consistent with uh, social discrimination or social expectations, but it's much more consistent with the biologically informed interests and personality differences. So that's okay. just uh, yeah. uh, that's just the premise uh, from a scientific point of view. Yeah. So this was actually going to be my my next question for you. Like, what does it really matter what we identify as the source um, or for for this? So we we know that this is what it looks like. This is a puzzling thing that this is what happens. Mm. Uh, we segregate, but uh, the cause of it. I think you mentioned al also before. It is very difficult to say if it's something from infancy or if it's something you're born with mm -hmm. that gives this, like, to separate this uh, uh, and to do real empirical research on it. So, what? Why does it really matter? Do you do you see where one could apply better than the other? Explanation. Well, let me back up a bit. Yeah, uh, sure. And so. 
from my personal point of view, mm. I don't care in the least. Okay. <laughs> yes. uh, for me, uh, it, it could be 100% w female professors, 100% mm. female doctors. Um, I can't see for my, from my personal point of view why it would matter so long as it's based on, on meritocracy. Mm -hmm. uh, so that I get the proper care when, when I go see a physician mm -hmm. and uh, I uh, ride safely when I'm on an airplane, mm -hmm. right? Uh, as long as that is uh, fulfilled, I'm perfectly happy. Mm -hmm. So the re reason why we have uh, so much concerns about this and probably unfortunately a bit too much um, time and effort is put in or has been put into this. I mean, uh, judging f from, from myself, mm. I put a, uh, a considerable amount of time into yeah. research into these matters, which I wouldn't have had to do mm. had it not been a politically uh, induced issue mm -hmm. where uh, we have decided, or, or at least our government uh, officials have decided, that this uh, segregation or these differences they are um, problems that need to be addressed mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and corrected for. Mm. And then you have to ask yourself then, well, if we do that, will things be, be better or worse mm. after doing so? And, and that's, uh, that's the, one of the important questions. Yeah. That means that the people in different professions, uh, like in academia, uh, they need to look at these uh, questions because if it, it would unfortunately be the case that a certain amount of intervention, certain kinds of interventions lead to poorer product, products or pro, uh, lower productivity, yeah. that is of course bad for, for the organization as such. Okay, so you've mentioned a lot of uh, value terms here. So you've said better and worse, for example. Mm. And of course, the question that comes up is for who? And then now you're mentioning um, as why I, how I understand uh, worse publications, for example, that that's bad for science somehow, maybe as a, as a well, thing, if it, entity? Yeah, well, or? I suppose uh, on, the, on the surface uh, it would be I suppose, mm. if you uh, um, have a, an organization that consumes uh, a given amount of resources and the purpose of the organization is to create a certain type of product, yes. then uh, given these two premises, mm. it would be better if it produced more products rather than less, yeah. right? And yeah. vice versa. Yeah. That stands to reason, doesn't it? Yes, yeah, for sure. Yeah. But, but that's also assuming that um, academia's way of being Mm -hmm. uh, has been the best way of being, right? So I think that's already what the gender study mm -hmm. uh, would argue with you on, maybe, <laughs> that uh, that isn't true already, that we haven't had objective science yes. uh, so uh, in the history of, <laughs> of how yeah. the system works. So your, right? point, your point here is simply that if the a typi more typically female way of doing science would mm. lead to fewer publications, it might also lead to other uh, things that are better in some sense. It I guess, could be yeah. yes. Uh, so that's correct. That uh, this calls into question um, a lot of things. Of course, it's simpler when you consider the uh, a factory that makes cars. Yes, you can measure example. that in the yeah. Which, yeah. And you could argue that yeah. better cars at a lower price uh, is always better. Yeah. Uh, then there is the the employee's perspective, which is a, t a total different uh, perspective. Mm. Then you could argue that the more well-performing car factory has more discontent workers, mm -hmm. right? Possibly. Mm. So if that's the case, uh, then you have to weigh these different values against e each other, yeah. and you could, uh, and then you can complicate things further by. Um, comparing the female and the male workers in the car factory mm. and say that perhaps the male workers are happy with their job but the female ones are not, mm. then what to do about it? Mm. Should we change the production line uh, according to the female's preferences even if it leads to fewer cars mm. being produced? I'm not sure. Mm. It's an open question. Yeah.
But can the females who who who, who like their job stay? <laughs> <laughs> of, of, co of course, they can stay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Good. I mean, obviously, when you put it like that, it does make um, uh, intuitive sense, I guess. So you're you're doing that analogy with university, I guess, with academia. No, or you, no, you. I no, I did that. I did it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I assumed you did. It. That's what was well, the point of your example. Well, you could do a similar anal analogy. Analogy, mm. definitely. And so we can, for example, uh, throw away the criterion of publications. We can say yeah. that publications are not important. Yeah. Let's that's measure just, it with teaching instead. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Uh, old -fashioned, an mm. old-fashioned silly criterion. Why should we uh, produce uh, research articles yeah. when we can produce, I don't know what, reports perhaps? Mm. Or better teaching? Mm. Uh, for sure, that can be questions, questioned. And someone has to decide. Mm. Uh, and what complicates the situation for academe is, of course, that it's a, a peer, in principle, a peer-controlled uh, organization. Mm. So it is the people who actually work in academe uh, who are supposed to d decide what academe is supposed to be and supposed to do and yeah. the criteria for various uh, things like research quality. Uh, but the th that that thing is now complicated by the fact that academe is also p paid for by the taxpayers and hence also controlled by politicians who have their own agenda, which might be more or less different than uh, than the academes themselves. Mm -hmm. So that that's a very important issue that we need to consider also. Yeah. yeah. So the uh, politicians might decide that we should uh, change. Mm. the criteria mm. f for good science. Yes. And what would that mean, do you think? Do you think that would... Do, do you m put value into that? Would you do that? Would you put value into it, saying that, oh, that would be worse for academia? Or does it just mean that it will be something else? Oh, different, yeah. difficult question. Well, uh, I think I share this view with many academics that the purpose of academe is to produce knowledge. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, given, given that, we should uh, have as a value to produce better knowledge and more knowledge with the same resources. Mm. And here, of course, is also an assumption that society that's what society wants us to produce mm -hmm. right yeah. and so when the politicians give us this um instructions to pr to um uh, be ha have this gender perspective or uh, yeah equality in uh, uh, all the all the levels then if the result is that we'll produce work uh, we won't produce uh, as much as much yeah mm -hmm. let's say uh, knowledge in the same way mm -hmm. uh, then of course this advice is ill, or not advice, this, uh, ge this policy is mm. ill-informed. Mm. Is that the... So you're trying to... So with your research, you're showing that this policy is ill-informed? Could you say that? Would you say that? No, I or, wouldn't go as no. far as... Be, because we haven't decided yet. Uh, no, okay. Yes. What, what is to, is yeah. to be the goal of, of yes. academe? But uh, uh, it has been for as long as we have known it. Yeah. Uh, it has been th these uh, goals to mm. produce knowledge. And if we are to change that, I suppose we need to have a discussion about it and put, uh, put these different values on the table mm. and, and decide collectively mm. how to do it. Um, I uh, r read something the other day. Uh, someone cited a uh, vice, vice chancellor at a Swedish university saying that perhaps we should consider changing the criteria for um, hiring professors in order to increase the proportion of women mm -hmm. uh, in the direction of putting more focus on, I think she said, um, a, a nice uh, work like environment. environment. I've yeah. heard that before. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Mm. Uh, so that's apparently one option mm -hmm. uh, to replace the criteria of, or at least add the criterion of a nice working environment and I'm sure that uh, uh, in some departments it, it will um, it will will actually lead to a nicer uh, environment mm. if uh, if you have a very small proportion of women at least that's my experience 
that the um, environment becomes a bit harsher and competitive uh, yeah. in a perhaps uh, less friendly way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, yeah, sure. But, and, and that uh, nicer environment, would you say, would produce better knowledge or research? I don't think so, be, yeah, I think because so. Uh, the general tendency is probably that more, more harsh and, and, uh, and competitive environments are more productive. Mm -hmm. So, uh, having a nice time uh, and presumably spending more time uh, with social uh, things uh, around the coffee tables do presumably, or at least seem unlikely to lead to better knowledge or uh, more knowledge mm. being produced. Mm. But that's, uh, it w is it as harsh as possible? Is that? No, definitely not. So there is a limit, there is I'm like sure a there balance? Is. Or? And I'm sure there is. Yeah. And it depends, uh, but th that's a whole different discussion. I okay. mean, the, mm -hmm. the harshness and uh, competitiveness of academe, mm. um, that's also a very interesting thing. I mean, if you want to talk about it, mm. I, uh, I could say that generally, my impression is that a very harsh environment produces some very, very high quality research, but it also sacrifices a lot of individuals who are um, you know, thrown out of the system mm -hmm. and uh, probably suffer quite a lot from that, from that experience. Mm -hmm. So it all, it all counts at a cost, right? Yes. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> you can imagine a thought experiment on the other hand, if we constructed an environment that is totally without demands and without competition, people maybe uh, have a very nice time but they would definitely uh, produce less, be mm. less productive, less creative, less innovative. Uh, that's my belief uh, and my impression from the, from the research. Mm. And in fact, it might even be so bad um, as of making people unhappy as well. If uh, there are no demands at all, mm -hmm. people tend to lose uh, the sense purpose. of meaning and purpose. Mm. Mm. Yes, oh, true. Yeah. But you mentioned, I want to get back to one thing you mentioned about differences between rich and, and less rich societies. Mm. And that's another very interesting pattern, which, you know, is as the sexual paradox, mm. um, meaning that sex segregation is generally higher in rich countries. Uh, so mm, uh, mm -hmm. the proportion of, of women amongst higher academics is higher in Russia mm. and mm -hmm. uh, in the former Soviet uh, countries mm. than it is in, in the uh, very egalitarian uh, Scandinavian countries, mm -hmm. which also speaks uh, totally against that, uh, the prevailing theory that is lack of opportunity that, that makes uh, uh, women drop out of high status positions. Mm -hmm. It seems to be quite the contrary. When they can choose themselves, they prefer perhaps um, not so com competitive mm. jobs, mm. for example, um, because and, and there is lots of anecdotal evidence in, for example, Susan Pinker Pinker's book from 2008, which is the title Stephen is Stephen Pinker. No, Susan, oh, Susan Pinker. Oh, yeah, he married Susan. But no, uh, he didn't. There's another one. Uh, no. Okay, sorry. Yeah, it's there's actually well, it's actually his sister. Oh, his sister. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> of course, he could have a sister. Yeah. And his uh, his <laughs> partner has uh -huh. a totally different name. I don't yeah. remember it right now. Um. But uh, she wrote uh, this book with the title of the Sexual Paradox, mm -hmm. where she uh, went through uh, a great deal of statistics, but also a lot of interviews and anecdotal observations she had, she had made mm. with uh, women saying that, uh, well, I, I have this, uh, you know, very, very high status, well-paid job, but I couldn't care less. It doesn't mm. interest me. Um, so I gave it up mm -hmm. and went home and sp spent time with my, my, um, my husband and my children. Yes. And it makes me much, much happier. Yeah. Mm. That's what she said. It's not me saying no, that. I understand. Yes, mm. yeah. And, uh, and the idea is that that has evolutionary... Um, if we generalize, that that would have an evolutionary explanation? or It seems very likely, although it's not a necessary condition mm. for the conclusion that m women uh, and men, for that matter, might be more happy if they uh, 
are left to their own devices and to choose as they see fit, mm. rather than being told by the government what they should choose. Yes. Uh, but uh, it is true that the, the ultimate reason for these preference differences probably have their roots in, in the evolution, yes. Mm. Okay, interesting. But so, uh, to round it up, but why do you think that, that people are so, um, uh, or why is it so controversial that you're saying this? Why do you p think people are not fully embracing everything that your research shows um, and that you've, we've spoken about here today? Why do you think people don't agree with you? Do um, they not? <laughs> Are you sure? Oh, the the people that don't agree with you. Yeah. yeah, I think I think. Why do you think that people in Sweden or women, maybe I w should even specify, are so unhappy in Sweden uh, that they would urge poli such political policies to inform academia and stuff like that? Why do you think? Well, that's that's a, that's a huge question. But yeah, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And very interesting, but. Mm. Let me first just note that the situation we are in today is a minuscule parenthesis uh, in, in the history of mankind. Mm. Had we asked people 50 or definitely 100 years ago, they would have found these thoughts perfectly uncontroversial and mm -hmm. self-evident. Of course, <laughs> yes. of course men and women are different. We know that. We know that from our first-hand experience. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's, it's, it wouldn't be an issue at all. Mm. And the reason that it has become an issue, uh, although it's probably, uh, although the evidence is actually pointing to the fact that yes, there are a real sex differences, and m m worse, worse still, they are probably mostly at least an effect of biological factors. Mm. The re reason why this is controversial today is probably, as I alluded to before, that we live in such a rich society that we can grasp for these very high-hanging fruits on the tree of aspirations, mm -hmm. if you will, mm -hmm. and that in doing so, it is absolutely necessary to ignore these uh, ideas, mm -hmm. uh, I mean these yeah. exp explanations, mm -hmm. because uh, then there would be um, that would kind of refute the whole idea of striving for sex equality. You wouldn't know what kind of, uh, what kind of outcome would be truly equal in that case. Mm -hmm. And it would complicate things uh, so much uh, that I think people would feel that their, uh, their striving for, for these values would suddenly become pointless uh, if it turns out that the the whole idea is ill thought right mm. that in fact what they're trying to do is to force people to do things against people's own best interest and their own desires and own will and then why pursue it yeah. and then the whole goal would be lost mm. uh, and many people i think uh, find an enormous amount of meaning in life and energy from pursuing goals of this kind, social equality goals. Mm. Because one reason being that there are so few other goals um, in people's lives, mm. uh, as, as we said before. Mm. Since all material needs are taken care of, the only remaining ones are psychological needs and higher ones at that. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. I think we have to leave it at that, even though I mm -hmm. have a million more questions. Mm -hmm. But I think you have to come back. And uh, it's a fascinating journey from your work in music and psychology mm. to where you are now. And I, I can really see that it's an important uh, question for you. Um, and, and, and the research that you're doing is, I think, very important in this area. So thank you so much for letting me uh, absorb all the information that you've given and for all the viewers as well. Thank you so much, Guy. Thank you for having me.